Om Ajnat Marandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanye Nathasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhukti Vedanta Swami Niti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Kadhadhar, Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. So welcome everyone to our study of uh, Bhagavad Gita at the level of Bhakti Shastri. We're looking at chapter 17, right? I'll just put the, share the screen here. Is everyone able to see? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. You can see? Uh-huh. Okay, so... Uh, Going ahead. Oh, we, well, we, we, we looked at, we were talking about faith and Arjuna had asked that question. Maybe you remember, Arjuna asked, what if someone has faith in a process but it's not, there's no scriptures or it's not according to any scriptures that we know, but he has faith in what he's doing. So what is his position? So Lord Krishna explained that then that faith will be in either goodness, passion or ignorance. And it's going to be mostly passion and ignorance. Rarely will it be in the mode of goodness. Remember the origin of faith, shrad, shraddha, comes from the mode of goodness. But the mode of goodness, because the material world and because of the influence of the material energy and the human nature, we become contaminated by passion and ignorance. So unless the mode of goodness is very pure, we won't be able to avoid the influence of passion and ignorance. And this is the position in the world today. There's many different religious traditions and different practices and they're very much influenced by passion and ignorance. Although the propounders, maybe in the beginning, the people were actually pure at heart and had good intentions, but in course of time became influenced by passion and ignorance. So similarly in our Krishna consciousness movement, we have to be very careful to try to keep up the standard of pure devotion and not to become influenced by the lower modes. We're going to look at how other items are also influenced by the modes of nature. Lord Krishna is going to explain to us like that. Uh, let's go ahead. Divisions of faith. Would someone like to read? Therefore, Krishna says here, Chai vidi bhavati shraddha dehina sa svabhavaja. If one is cultivating his life like hogs and cats and dogs, their behavior is also like that. And remaining in that position, so his faith and one who is advanced, who is worshipping the deity, 
and having three times bath and chanting mantras, Hare Krishna, they are not equal. Just a minute, I'll give you the rest. Go ahead. That is, not that is not possible because one is situated in the sattva guna and the other is situated in tama guna. Although the tama gunas, the persons who are in the darkness of knowledge, they have got their faith. It is not that they have no faith. They have got faith, but that faith is in the lowest status of life. That faith will not help him for spiritual realization. Bhagavad Gita 17. Point one to three, Honolulu, July 4, 1974. Thank you. So, Prabhupada is giving very clear direction here, helping us to understand the situation of many of these different religious practices. That they have got their faith. Yeah, they have faith. But, he says, it will not help them for spiritual realization and often they don't want spiritual realization they have some material motive some other purpose in mind but Prabhupada describes clearly that the benefit of cultivating Krishna consciousness and he describes what it means to be in the mode of goodness worshipping the deity taking bath three times a day and chanting mantras, Hare Krishna. So that is actually spiritual life. That is for sp spiritual realization. But the other things, whatever other pe things other people are doing, very nice, okay, it's good, but it's not going to help them for spiritual realization. If they're situated in the mode of, good, mode of ignorance, you cannot expect to get spiritual realization. So looking over the main points of the chapter, the first ten verses describing faith, and then later on Krishna will go on to describe about worship and foods in the modes, and then we will hear about sacrifice, austerity, and charity in the modes. And then the final section of the chapter, we'll hear about how by chanting Om Tat Sat, we can purify everything. So it's a short chapter, but very powerful. And message is very important to understand how the modes of nature influence these different items. All right, next section, verses 4... Oh. Mark, I have a question, can I ask? All right. Pray about the faith, as you mentioned. So like you, uh, we are preaching in a tribal way. The, so they have faith, they are ready, they are um, reading Prabhupada books, Bhagavad Gita, they are attending our regular classes, but still they have their rituals like animal sacrifice. Like what? They are uh, killing animals, they are eating this, and they have this uh, animal sacrifice. Uh -huh. So they have a very uh, strong faith on that. So how to change? Is it possible? No, by reading Prabhupada books and um, one day they will change. They will come to this self-realization. Well, <laughs> it's up to them. They, it will depend how, how much they can take Prabhupada's book seriously, how much they can genuinely accept the teachings which are in Prabhupada's books. They have to be really convinced and they have to feel something is actually wrong in what they're doing, killing animals, sacrificing animals. If they're really convinced on that, if, if that's where their faith is really at, then it will be difficult for them. But still we have to try and Krishna consciousness can be given to them somehow. You, you know, we let them chant the holy name of Krishna and if they chant, if they have genuine attempts to chant the holy name and 
take part in our spiritual program and eating the food which we offer also, then gradually it can, it can change them. But they, they have to be, be willing to change. Sometimes the people are very attached to these things which, which they're doing. As you say, they have strong faith in the animal sacrifice. So it may be difficult to change them, but it's good, good that you're trying. We definitely want to try to give some spiritual benefit, spiritual education to these kind of people. It's not easy, but we have to try. Krishna consciousness is in everyone that can be awakened. They have to hear. So, and one of them, and like last time I discussed with their leaders, so they are saying like that this you know, animal killing, it's their ancestor they are doing. So if they stop, maybe something go wrong because they are worshipping some baby, some so if they stop, maybe something go wrong to the villagers and other people. So that's why we are also fearful to say, you know, stop killing, you know, the, how it's uh, not good. They may stop our, they, they may you know, stop our program, cannot don't come to our, our village. We are also fearful. Yes. Yeah, difficult, difficult preaching. But Lord Krishna is very kind when devotees will take risks for the sake of preaching. Lord Krishna can help. It certainly it's not an easy situation to try to introduce Krishna consciousness in such an environment to such people. Prabhupada writes in the purport, in one purport, he said that these people who are hunters of animals, they are de they're demons in the mode of ignorance. So they're do you say people they are doing animal sacrifice. This is certain. They're hunters, Maharaj. Hmm? They're hunters, Maharaj. They are the tribal people. They're yeah. staying in Yeah, very much. So tribal people, you know, they have some definitely a lot of connection with the mode of ignorance. But still, they are also spirit souls. They're part and parcel of Krishna. Now, how much you will be able to affect them will be difficult to know. Maybe one or two people will take it up seriously, and if they, if they do, then they may have to leave that community. You see, that's what may actually happen. If somebody actually is serious and really wants to take up Krishna consciousness, he would have to ultimately go away from that community. And that may create problems for you also. That the tribal, you know, the, the chief may not like that one or two of their people are going away to join you. I don't know, has the people usually leave the tribal community or do they all stay there? Do they have that sense of belonging? stay there, but normally they have like a like division. They sect, they divided themselves, you know, they, they tell, okay, you are not following something else, so you stay away from us. Hmm. All right, anyway, you know, you have to go, you have to preach. If you don't preach to them, the Christians will come there, Christians will preach to them. There are many other groups. The Muslims also, they go around and they also get people to join them. Christians, they are doing Maras there. They have already converted two, three families this village. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, so that's why we are focusing this village. Because they are already converted two, three families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll go on. Yeah, that's common. So, good luck. Certainly you can get the mercy of Lord Chaitanya. Give them the mercy of Lord Chaitanya and you also get the mercy. The more you give the mercy, the more you get the mercy. So it's good preaching. All right, but let's look at the Bhagavad Gita here. We have a, a section about 
uh, in the first ten verses, we didn't really look at the description of foods in the mode of ignorance, foods in different modes of nature. That's important, right? That food and of course worship also is described in the modes of nature, but particularly food, something which we're all interested in. We all like to eat food. We all have to have food. So we can hear about food in the mode of ignorance. And food in the mode of passion and food in the mode of goodness, right? Uh, text number... Text number seven. Even, even the food each person prefers is of three kinds, according to the three modes of material nature. The same is true of sacrifice, austerities and charity. Now hear of the distinction between them. And then text 8 goes on. Foods dear to those in the mode of goodness increase the duration of life purify one's existence and give strength, health, happiness and satisfaction. And then Krishna describes what kind of foods they are. Such foods are juicy, fatty, wholesome and pleasing to the heart. So these qualities are very important. It's very good to, to know these things because we're often preaching to people about the importance of diet and we want to tell them the benefit of the vegetarian diet. So it's described here, not just vegetarian diet, but food in the mode of goodness, increases the duration of life. That's important. People all want to live a long life. Purify one's existence. Not everybody wants that. They give strength, people like that. Health, people like that. Happiness, satisfaction, these things, these qualities everyone's interested in. So it's, it's very good to you know, know this verse and to be able to quote this. Duration of life, purify one's existence. And give strength, health, happiness and satisfaction. Srila uh, Prabhupada then go, uh, or Krishna then says, foods in the mode of passion, they're too bitter, too sour, salty, hot, pungent, dry and burning are dear to those in the mode of passion. Such foods cause distress, misery and disease. We know different cultures, different parts of the world, they will take food, these kinds of things. Some places they have food very salty, some places it's very hot, you know, I should have a lot of chilies, like that, I should, or sometimes it's got to be very bitter. So it just creates disease. And then food in the mode of ignorance, food prepared more than three hours before being eaten. Food that is tasteless, decomposed and putrid, and food consisting of remnants and untouchable things is dear to those in the mode of darkness. So, this is also important to note, what kind of foods we don't take. Three hours after being cooked, if it's been sitting around for more than three hours, it's not fresh. But of course, this does not apply to prasada. Prasada we can eat, but generally we don't take food which has been sitting around. Prabhupada's purport is interesting. The purpose of food is to increase the duration of life, purify the mind and aid bodily strength. You can see that's the mode of goodness. Food in the mode of ignorance is just the opposite. This is its only purpose. In the past, great authorities selected those foods that best aid health and increase life's duration, such as milk products, sugar, rice, wheat, 
fruits and vegetables. These foods are very dear to those in the mode of goodness. Some other foods, such as baked corn and molasses, while not very palatable in themselves, can be made pleasant when mixed with milk or other foods. They are then in the mode of goodness. All these foods are pure by nature. They are quite distinct from untouchable things like meat and liquor. Fatty foods, as mentioned in the 8th verse, have no connection with animal fat obtained by slaughter. Animal fat is available in the form of milk, which is the most wonderful of all foods. Milk, butter, cheese and similar products give animal fat in a form which rules out any need for the killing of innocent creatures. It is only through brute mentality that this killing goes on. The civilized method of obtaining fat is by milk. Slaughter is the way of subhumans. Protein is amply available through split peas, dal, whole wheat, etc. Foods in the mode of passion. Foods in the mode of passion which are bitter, salty, too hot, over overly mixed with red pepper, cause misery by reducing the mucus in the stomach, leading to disease. Foods in the mode of ignorance or darkness are essentially those that are not fresh. Any food cooked more than three hours before it is eaten, except prasadam, is considered to be in the mode of darkness. Because they are decomposing, such foods give a bad odour, often attracts people in this mode, but repulses those in the mode of goodness. Remnants of food may be eaten only when they are part of a meal that was first offered to the Supreme Lord, or first, first eaten by saintly persons, especially spiritual master. Otherwise, remnants of food are considered to be in the mode of darkness, and they increase infection or disease. Such foodstuffs, although very palatable to persons in the mode of darkness, are neither light nor even touched by those in the mode of goodness. Best food is the remnants of what is offered to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Okay, like that. So that's food in the different modes. Right? You want to increase the duration of life, you want health, happiness, satisfaction, strength. So these things come from food in the mode of goodness. And Prabhupada describes what type of food is in the mode of goodness. He said milk, wheat, sugar, and these things. Dal, you, people sometimes say, oh vegetarian, you don't get enough protein. But pro you get all the protein you need. You take dal, you take wheat. You, the meat eaters have too much protein. And that's also not good for health. All right, any questions about food in the modes? No questions? We'll go ahead. All right. We'll, Yes. Because in South India we prepare idlis and the idli should be like the batter should be a little bit fermented. So the fermentation is like uh, really in the, it's in the mode of ignorance. Is it okay that like uh, how is it Maharaj? Mm. Because we have to ferment the batter for the making idlis and all like that. Yeah, definitely Italy. I've never heard anything wrong about Italy. I've never heard anyone say it's in the mode of ignorance. Yeah, but uh, it is fermented. It's that we should not uh, take the fermented uh, this one. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's part... At least eight, eight hours we have to keep it for fermenting, then only we can get good idlis. Mm -hmm. Even for that matter, dosa and all, so we have to keep at least eight hours for uh, fermenting. Mm. No, we are not using any other, this one, because that urad dal or that, uh, this one, black gram is itself makes it uh, 
Oh. Yes, mm. Well, I've never heard anybody say that idlis or dosas were all in the mode of ignorance. <laughs> uh, I know everyone enjoys them. They're very tasty. Uh, but as far as uh, the fermentation process goes, I don't know. It's an interesting point. Uh, I know, like, we, we're not supposed to use yeast when we do baking. We don't use yeast. We don't like to use yeast because yeast is also a part of that's a fermentation process. Maharaj, uh, I, I got a comment on this. Uh, His Krishna Siva Kavacha Prabhu, the uh, deity minister, mm -hmm. he, when he was doing the deity worship with us and the deity worship uh, uh, session, so that time he mentioned that uh, anything which is naturally fermented, like idli, um, in the batter, idli batter, you keep it overnight and then next day morning it's fermented. So that is all allowed. But unnaturally fermented, you know, usually bread and all those things which are unnaturally fermented. Those those are not good. But when you offer it to Krishna, then he can have it. That's what he had suggested. Okay. We offer it to Krishna. Yes. I, I think fermentation process is referring to something which has already been offered to Krishna and then gone off. Yes. Right, if something's fermented, it's gone bad, it's fermented. But if fermentation process is part of the preparation process, something is not yet offered to Krishna, then you can use it. Maybe, maybe like that. I'm not clear. But uh, certainly if something has, has fermented, you know, so we, we, you have, you've made a preparation and then, oh, it, oh, it fermented overnight, it's gone off, you know. But he, he, in this way, in, case of, in the case of the preparation of dosas and idlis, fermentation is part of the process for the preparation. It's utilized. It's not the final stage, of course, right? something is fermented, that's not the final stage. You're going to use it, but you're going to use that to prepare the idli or to prepare the dosa. But the, the, the ferment, when they talk about fermenta food which is fermented, that's food which has gone off, which have lost its natural, the, you know, the taste of how it's meant to be. So that kind of food is not acceptable, not good for health. Okay, we'll go ahead. We have one more hand raise. Oh, Since really? Uh -huh. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, yes, uh, we discussed about onion and garlic yesterday. So, uh, there are lots of medicines in which onion and garlic can also use, and particularly in some household remedies, with, uh, with lots of hair or onion and garlic. And uh, garlic is also uh, said to be useful in. Curing a few few diseases, it's like that. We have, I've heard it in household remedies a lot, but uh, we uh, being devotees, we tend to avoid it. But then just another thought: if it means if uh, to use them as medicines and not eating them, maybe applying them in somewhere in the body, something like can can then be used. What, what is the recommendation? Uh. Well, definitely it's better, if you're going to take the medicine internally, it's better to avoid it and find some, some other thing, some other substitute. I have heard that garlic is only cured for intestinal worms. There are some, some diseases, they say garlic is the only cure, you know. Okay, so... You know, it may be for medicinal purposes, you may have to take it. Maharaj, I have a small uh, comment. Uh, instead of garlic for any medicinal purpose, we can use the leaf of ajwain. Because ajwain is like good for the stomach or uh, any like uh, cough or all those things. Because uh, ajwain leaves or ajwain also can be used for all this instead of uh, garlic. 
which is really good fun. Ajuan, oh, use Ajuan. It's a leaf, is it? Adam's leaf. Adam leaves. What leaf? We say Ajuan or Karam, Karam, C A R O M I suppose to manage. Karam. Yes. We say Ajuan in. Ajuan. Ajuan, yeah, I know Ajuan. Yes, we use the leaves of those of Ajuan or Ajuan plant we have. So leaves of that is very good for cough or stomach, any upsets or anything like that. No need to take garlic, yeah. No, Maharaj. No, very good. Oh, so thank you very much, Maharaj. So here's very good advice. It's usually you can find something else to replace it. Onion and garlic, you know, it's not, it's really tamasic and better we avoid it. When they grow garlic in the fields, everything, everything else is finished. Nothing can grow around it. It's so devastating, has such a devastating effect on the ground and on the environment. Better to avoid it altogether. Onions and garlics. People are so addicted to these things. It's just the mode of ignorance. So better we don't encourage it. Try and stay away from it. All right, we'll go ahead. Uh, just one more thing. Yes? Uh, it's, it's a different uh, topic maybe. In the third verse of 17th chapter, in the last paragraph, it is uh, the technical explanation is there that uh, faith is originally in the mood of good, but uh, uh, heart being contaminated by different uh, moods, so one is, uh, one's faith also becomes in different moods, so in good especially in the world. I was trying to understand that how the faith originally is in, it, it is in the mode of goodness and then with a different type of combination of the heart that reflects differently. Well, just like our consciousness is originally pure, but when we're in con contact with the material energy, we become influenced by the modes of nature. Right? Okay. Our consciousness is originally pure, coming from the soul, but it's in contact with the material energy and we identify with the material energy and we start to think about exploiting and enjoying independently of the Supreme Lord. So in the same way our faith is originally in the mode of goodness, but in contact with the material energy because of our association with the modes of passion and ignorance, our faith also becomes corrupted. Uh, here, my uh, just like contamination of the heart is being talked of. Yes. So, uh, what does heart refer to? I mean, does it refer to the consciousness or, or mind? Or what? Yes, consciousness. Yeah. The, co our, our consciousness from the heart, our feelings of the heart, right? The feeling of the heart. We talked about, if, remember the weakness of heart? What was the weakness of heart, which was the cause of our bewilderment, our entanglement in the banyan tree, chapter 15? Remember the first five verses of chapter 15? They were about the, weak, the weakness of the heart. And the weakness of the heart was attachment to the material world and our identification with the different objects of the material world and how we wanted to exploit them and enjoy them and be the proprietor. So this is all connected with the heart, the different feelings, the emotions which we experience, the conceptions which we have, thoughts which are there in the mind all due to our weak weakness of the heart. I mean, obviously here we are not talking of heart, the organ. We are talking of either the consciousness or the subtle body. Yes. Well, subtle body. Where is, it? Where is the subtle body? Where is the mind? And it's the heart. We speak, generally we speak about the heart. It's all there with the heart. The soul is in the heart. 
And the mind, subtle body is also there, also of course. So, yes, we speak of the heart, but it's, we're concerned with some, the subtle, the unmanifested, the consciousness. And consciousness is coming from the heart. The mind is also in the heart. Is it all right? Okay, text number 11 describes about sacrifice. Sacrifice according to direction of scripture, as a matter of duty, by those who desire no reward, is of the nature of goodness. Right? You can understand, when we perform Sankirtan, it's according to the direction of scripture, it's a matter of duty, and we do it without any desire of reward. It's a wonderful uh, exhibition of the mode of goodness. To go out on Sankirtan, or to do book distribution, to distribute Krishna consciousness, this is the mode of goodness. And you get the greatest benefit. So we should understand this. Then, but sacrifice in the mode of passion is described. Perform for some material benefit or for the sake of pride. That's the mode of passion. You can see the big difference between goodness and passion. In the mode of passion, people are always thinking, what am I going to get? What's, it, what's in it for me? What, what do I gain? So people, out of pride, they don't want to go on Harinam Sankirtan. The people, some people, some people will say, oh, I'm not going to do that. Oh, I don't want people to see me. I don't want to go out there and chant. No. It's, a, it's pride. They don't want to do what they're supposed to do. And any sacrifice performed without regard for the direction of scripture, without distribution of prasada, without chanting of Vedic hymns and remuneration to the priest, and without faith is considered to be in the mode of ignorance. So Prabhupada was always concerned, distribution of prasada, whenever he would give a lecture, he liked to distribute prasadam to all the people. Uh, I remember in Calcutta, we were not many devotees, and we would simply purchase some sandesh from a Bengali sweet shop, and Prabhupada would distribute a piece of sandesh to everyone. But some kind of prasadam has to be there. We know Prabhupada in 26 Second Avenue, he would cut up one apple and give a piece of apple to everyone. And so it's such an important principle that wherever you're doing some glorification of the Lord, we're doing some yagya, there should be prasadam distribution. And there should be also chanting of the Ved. There must be some kirtan, there must be the chanting of Vedic mantras. These things are important. All right. Then going on, text number 14, austerity of the body. It's surprising to read this when you read what is actually austerity of the body. First of all, there's austerity of the body, austerity of the mind, and austerity of words. Krishna begins with the austerity of the body, first of all. And he said, it consists of worship of the Supreme Lord, the Brahmanas, the spiritual master and superiors like father and mother, and in cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy, and non-violence. We, we may be surprised, what, I have to worship my mother and father? My mother and father, they're demons, they're meat eaters, they're sinful, uh, uh, why I should worship them? But Prabhupada, taught devotees to respect their parents. And there's a famous incident, Prabhupada uh, disciple, one of his first disciples was Brahmananda 
Prabhu. Now Brahmananda had a big, powerful, strong body and he joined with his brother and they were very active. Uh, so their mother came to meet Prabhupada and Brahmananda, Gargamuni, they're, both, they're from the Jewish family, so their Jewish mother came to meet Prabhupada and uh, when, Pra when she came to meet Prabhupada, Prabhupada told Brahmananda, bow down to your mother, bow down to your mother. So Brahmananda got down on his hands and knees, bowed down to his mother. <laughs> How to worship your father and mother? How will you do it? Maybe in, in the Vedic culture, quite simply, you can come and touch the feet every morning. Sometimes, often the daughter-in-law is staying in the home, staying in her husband's home with, with her husband's mother and father. So every morning the daughter-in-law should come and touch the feet of her mother-in-law and father-in-law and take blessings from them. It's an act of respect. It's an act of worship. It's a very simple worship, but it shows the greatest respect and it's very much appreciated. It can really make a difference to the atmosphere. So, like that, we can worship superiors, like our mother and father. And we are also supposed to worship also the brahmanas, the spiritual master, just like in our temple. We worship Srila Prabhupada every morning. We have Prabhupada's Guru Puja. And uh, also it's important, clean, cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy and non-violence the mode of goodness, austerity in the mode of goodness, keeping clean. It's an austerity to take bath every time. After you use the toilet, you should take bath. Prabhupada taught us like this. Celibacy, householders also practice celibacy by following regulative principles. Non-violence, not speaking harshly to people. This is all austerity of, in the mode of goodness. There's austerity, auster, there's austerity in passion and austerity in ignorance. Oh, sorry. Uh, Prabhupada said one should offer or le learn to offer respect to God or to the demigods. The perfect, qualified brahmanas and the spiritual master, superiors, father, mother, or any person who is conversant with Vedic knowledge, these should be given proper respect. One should practice cleansing oneself externally and internally, and he should learn to become simple in behavior. He should not do anything which is not sanctioned by the scriptures. Then, austerity of speech consists in speaking words that are truthful, pleasing, beneficial and not agitating to others and also in regularly reciting Vedic literature. We'll just read Prabhupada's purport. One should not speak in such a way as to agitate the minds of others. Of course, when a teacher speaks, he can speak the truth for the instruction of his students. But such a teacher should not speak to those who are not his students, if he will agitate their minds. So Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, however, told them, no, you should give some charity. You come to a holy place, these people who are in the holy places who are begging, they're not ordinary beggars. And it's, it's proper to give some charity. But you, you can give small charity. You don't have to give big amounts. 
Just like Srila Prabhupada was traveling in a train one time and the train stopped in the station and some beggars came by and they saw Prabhupada with the devotees and they came and they asked Prabhupada, please give some charity, give some donation. So Prabhupada gave a couple of rupees and gave them two rupees or something. And then they, the beggar held the money and said, oh, only two rupees. And Prabhupada said, you are a beggar. <laughs> Prabhupada didn't think, to, I'm not going to give you any more. You're a beggar. You don't give a beggar a hundred rupees. You don't give them big money. You give them small money. Is it clear? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, I have a question regarding that. Yes, okay, go ahead. I mean, generally, uh, it is, uh, uh, we, have also, we also hear that uh, giving uh, some cash or some small charity to the beggar, and if they misuse it, you're going to get a reaction to it. But simultaneously, there's a higher principle of giving charity, not refusing to a beggar when he's asking for a charity, as you said. So, uh, how does these two things uh, generally be applied? Well, generally, you know, when we give charity, we, we prefer to give people prasadam rather than give them money because we can give prasadam freely to everyone. But if we give money, we don't know how they're going to use the money. But I mean, uh, it's very, uh, it's not very often that we carry some prasadam along with us. I'm going on in car to a street like that, you know, people, uh, beggars approach me and I don't have any prasad. Often I do not have any prasad with me to give. So uh, if I'm having few coins, maybe five rupees or say, uh, five rupees, two rupees, something like that, and I give it to them and uh, I don't know whether they're going to use it in, in their, uh, uh, properly or they're just going to buy a cigarette and smoke out of it. That's right. That's the problem. That's why it's better to always carry some prasadam with you. And what if, if you're not carrying the prasad? Should we give them a, a little bit of cash or should we give them a little bit? I mean, well, it's a risk. It's a risk. You don't know what they're going to do with the money. Uh, but I heard in that particular case, Prabhupada did give some coin, did, did, did give some small amount to the beggar. And generally, in, in the holy place, in the holy place, you would give some money. You can give some money. You, but you can also give prasadam there. So what is the higher principle? To give charity uh, and to take the risk, as you said, that there is a risk. What is the higher principle? To give a little bit of charity and take the risk. Well, the, the better principle is to give the holy name and to give prasadam. If, if in circumstances we don't have prasadam. Oh, but then we, you, should, you, should have, you should have. You can go and get some prasadam and give it to them. You, you go and get something, you go and buy some fruit and give it to them. Rather than just to give them money. If you buy some fruit and give it to them, then you know they got the fruit. Of course, they may take the fruit and go and sell it to get money to buy cigarettes, you don't know. But there's, in everything there's always some risk. So everyone, you have to decide for yourself what you want to do. How, if you want to give charity, if you don't. Sometimes, of course, you give, you give one person charity, another ten people come. I know, in, coming in Calcutta airport, there, there was, there's been, you know, for, for over the years, I see children there from time to time, and the children there, they're trained practically. They'll say, oh, Hare Krishna, and they'll say, any prasadam? Have you got prasadam? You know, they want prasadam. They're happy to get prasadam. Because generally, the devotees like to give prasadam, and they don't much like to give them money. Because, you know, if they give money, then the mother or the father may take the money and use it for something sinful. So they prefer to just give them prasadam. So, regarding this principle of uh, if uh, the 
thing given to the beggar, they are misused. And uh, the, why is it that uh, uh, the, the person who is given something to the beggar, he'll also get the reaction because you know, maybe they have given it for a good cause and uh, 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 for a help. And they, uh, they were not informed, obviously, they were not told that it's going to be misused. They give it in good mood. And why is it that they'll get the reaction? Well, they're involved. They give something. They, 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 they give something, so there has to be some act, some reaction from it. So that's why we should be very careful what we give and who we give it to. It was said about Maharaj Janak. Maharaj Janak, he was giving, he would give charity indiscriminately as a Kshatriya king. He would give charity to everyone. He didn't care if they were rich or poor. He didn't care what their caste was. Everyone. He had so he had, you know he he wanted to give charity in such a manner. But then you've got kings like Nriga, Nriga in the tenth canto. He was giving charity to the brahmanas, and he would select the most qualified brahmanas who were poor, who didn't have much money. He, he would give them charity. So every individual has their choice, how, who you would like to give charity to. But the highest principle is to give Krishna consciousness, to give Krishna consciousness. That's the highest charity. You give people the holy name, you give them a book. And you know, if we, if we do give them charity, we should get them to chant the holy name, you should tell them, chant Hare Krishna get them to chant, and then you can think to give them some charity. Okay. So much. Yes? Uh, can I add uh, something that I discovered in Srimad Bhagavatam? Yes, please. Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam uh, 4.934, uh, Srila Prabhupada says, in this age, distribution of prasad has replaced distribution of money. No one has sufficient money to distribute, but if we distribute Krishna Prasad, as far as possible, this is more valuable than the distribution of money. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. This is, it's good. There are a number of devotees. Wherever they go, they take prasadam with them, and they often find opportunities to distribute prasadam. So it's certainly a good habit to keep some prasadam with you and you can all, you always find people willing to take prasadam. People are happy to get prasadam. Uh, just another, uh, may, may I ask, ask another question regarding this? Okay. Uh, well, uh, in, uh, these days, I mean, in, in particular in any society, I mean, we talk of our own society, it's not. Uh, we are involved in uh, making of big big temples, like the UBT is coming up, and there are lots of big projects coming up. And simultaneously, in any big project, the yeah, devotees involved and the devotees, they may have their previous backgrounds in which they uh, tend to misuse the money. I mean, uh, the, uh, this is a bit, uh, the, this we have, we recently saw it in, in a Delhi temple, that lo uh, the donations which were collected on the, in the name of the building the temple, they were kind of uh, not proper accountable, accountability, and the money got misused, and uh, this, uh, now they are like, we are trying to search it out, where did the money go, uh, exactly when, that, you know, the temple is uh, not constructed properly also, and the money, the, lots of money came, but it didn't go properly used. Maybe due, due to the negligence of the management, or due to the negligence, uh, or uh, there is some ulterior motive the money got used by some other devotee who was involved in and they did. So, uh, regarding the, the principle of charity, which uh, uh, Guru has tried to maintain the charity, and Simon is supposed to be responsible for that. I mean, he has to see that money gets properly utilized. So I just wanted, uh, uh, if you can share some comment on that. Well, that risk is always there everywhere. We try as much as possible to avoid these things. 
And Prabhupada was certainly aware that it could happen. And generally, you know, the principle is there's, there should be like three signers on every check. And whatever money is received, whatever money comes in, it must be deposited in the bank. Everything which comes in should go in the bank and is shown in the bank and then it's taken out from the bank. So that there's very clear records of the, 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 the cash transactions. And so, yeah, uh, we want to benefit, we want, when we give charity, we want to see that the money is properly used. And so that's a, that's a responsibility of the management of each temple, that they have to see that the money is properly taken care of, that it's not used, it's not wasted. But that, that risk is there everywhere. Because money is involved generally, the risk is always there. Yes, I agree. It's a problem. But, you know, you're working with the material energy, these things, it's going to be there. We have to always be on top of it. We have to always be working and trying to monitor and keep control of everything. From time to time these things will happen. Has there been any such case study in the time of Srila Prabhupada and how Prabhupada dealt with it? What? Has there been any such case study of money being misused in the time of Srila Prabhupada and how Prabhupada dealt with it? Just, you know, yes, so, yeah, of course, there were cases. Yeah. All the time you get these kind of cases, they say it all the time. How did Prabhupada deal with it? Well, he said we have to be very careful. That this, this is the job, temple managers, they have to be very responsible and very uh, much on top of these things. Make sure all the money is deposited into the bank, goes through the bank. And then when the money is coming out, then they sign checks. There should be two or three names there on each check. No one person. All right, charity in the modes. This is charity in the mode of passion. Rajasik means for the sake of name. Right? I'm on the slide, the slide here on the slideshow. Rajasik means for the sake of name. All oh, people who say, I am so charitable. That is Rajasik. People generally, they like that. People, you know, pe people today are very much in the mode of passion. And you want people to donate, they want to know, what are you going to do for me? <laughs> right? If I, if I give you charity, what are you going to do for me? People, they would like to be known as charitable. We would, so we'll say, we'll put your name up, that you, you were so charitable. So, of course, this is the mode of passion. People want name. But charity in the mode of goodness, remember, charity in the mode of goodness was that, uh, that it is, is done without people knowing. They will do it without people being aware that they're giving charity. They don't want recognition. It should be done out of duty, without expecting anything in return, the proper time and place, and to worthy person. Prabhupada, we see in the, in the tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Lord Krishna came to Kurukshetra at the time of the solar eclipse. And he came with all of his family, and he came there to perform sacrifice, and he gave charity, because that's the proper time to give charity during the eclipse. Prabhupada mentions about this, that 
at the time of an, a lunar or solar eclipse or at the end of the month or to a qualified Brahmana or Vaishnava. So this, this should, this is proper charity and is done without, without recognition. One's not thinking about getting respect. So to do it without people knowing, that's the highest charity. Prabhupada was in Vrindavan one time and they found, a, they found a big sum of money had been put into the donation box in Prabhupada's room. It was really a lot of money and it was foreign currency. And they were wondering who could have put this money here. And then they thought about it carefully and then they remembered there was this one man, he was actually from Italy, and they found him and they brought him and they brought him to meet Prabhupada. And he was a very nice man and he went on, later on became initiated and uh, he did a, he's a very active devotee in Italy. But in, initially he came, he was, he'd been in Vrindavan and he was going around temples and hearing different people and he came to Prabhupada's place and Prabhupada was talking in his room and he was there hearing. He was impressed and he gave a big donation and he got the mercy of Prabhupada. So that was one example. Now, going ahead, text 21, coming back to Bhagavad Gita. Text 21, charity performed with expectation of some return or with a desire for fruit of result or in a grudging mood is said to be charity in the mode of passion. Right? You do it in a grudging mood. You didn't really want to give it, but you do it because you're kind of forced to do it. That's charity in the mode of passion. Not good. No, it... And, or you do it to get something in return. Prabhupada mentions in the purport, perform for elevation to the heavenly kingdom and sometimes with great trouble and with repentance afterwards. Oh, why have I spent so much in this way? Charity is also sometimes given under some obligation at the request of a superior. These kinds of charity are said to be given in the mode of passion. There are many charitable foundations which offer their gifts to institutions where sense gratification goes on. Such charities are not recommended in the Vedic scripture. Only charity in the mode of goodness is recommended. And then charity, text 22, charity in the mode of ignorance, performed at an impure place, at an improper time, to unworthy persons or without proper attention and respect, is said to be in the mode of ignorance. And Prabhupada's purport, contribution for indulgence in intoxication and gambling are not encouraged here. That sort of contribution is in the mode of ignorance. Such charity is not beneficial. Rather, sinful persons are encouraged. Similarly, if a person gives charity to a suitable person, but without respect and without attention, that sort of charity is also said to be in the mode of darkness. All right, it's coming back to the slide. Another quote from Prabhupada. Someone can read, please. The slide. Can I read, Maharaj? Yes, please. Yeah. Hare Krishna, uh, charity in the modes and tamasic, one who does not know where the money is going. Just like in the Bo Bovedi streets, some that drunkard comes and polishes the motor car and somebody gives five dollars and he immediately goes to drink. That means this charity means give him impetus for drinking. So if charity creates such drunkard, 
Oh, that is very dangerous. He has to suffer. The man who is giving in charity. Lecture, Los Angeles, February 2nd, 1968. So uh, Prabhupada describing here said in, in the Bowery Street, in the Bowery Street is a region in New York. In Prabhupada's time it was a very bad area and there were many uh, vagrant people, you know, homeless people living there, many alcoholics there. So these kind of people were there and Prabhupada saw that he'd been there, he, you know, he was sometimes even living in that neighborhood. So he saw how sometimes these drunk people would come and they would polish the car and ask money from the person. So the drunk would come and polish the car and then ask some money and the man may give him money. But that's charity in the mode of ignorance and you're going to suffer. So we have to be very careful about giving charity. There should be some careful discrimination. The best charity is to give for Krishna consciousness. Sometimes you know you can give books, and sometimes you can maybe give for the, the deity worship, sponsor some deity worship, or you give to help build a temple. People are donating for the TOVP. Of course, in everything, there's always the risk. The money will not be used properly, but we have to do as much as we can to make sure everything is carefully controlled and monitored. All right, we'll go ahead. Do you want to take a question? I think you will be copy for Mataji. Okay. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, I would like to have from your this one Maharaj, the like a blood donation or organ donation. Nowadays they say that if you're healthy after that you can uh, do eye donation or this blood donation also. Can you give, throw some light on that Maharaj? <laughs> well, you give some blood in the future maybe somebody will give blood back to you. Mm -hmm. Right? You give an organ, maybe in the future you get the organ back. Maybe next life or something. Some people, we know, uh, for example, we had Shamsundar Prabhu, he, he had to have an organ transplant. And one of the devotees was kind enough, one devotee from, I think it was Chaupati, was kind enough to donate an organ for Shamsundar Prabhu. And it was certainly good for Shamsundar Prabhu that he was able to write his book Chasing the Rhinos with Swamiji, very wonderful descriptions about his travelling and accompanying Prabhupada and how they established Krishna consciousness, how he came to London and met George Harrison and then went to India and all the preaching they did. So it was certainly a Work, a valuable contribution to give him the organs that he could stay in the world, he could write these books. It's doubtful, I don't know. Some people say, you know, we live by the grace of Krishna, just depend on Krishna. Why take somebody else's organ or get blood from other people? There are some religious sects, they don't have blood transplant. They, they won't do blood transplants. They won't do organ transplants. It depends a lot on the individual. Prabhupada cer certainly, he didn't want that. Prabhupada told us, he said, don't give me to the doctors. <laughs> he said, don't give me to the doctors. He said, I don't want all these tubes and tests. Prabhupada saw, you know, what goes on in these hospitals and, you know, so many tubes and needles and tests. And, of course, they can't save anybody from death. We're all going to die. So, a number of us, you know, we don't want to die in a hospital, really. It's not very desirable to leave the body in a hospital. 
with a bunch of tubes and things stuck in you. And sometimes cannot be avoided, but it's better just to let nature take its course and just depend on Krishna fully. What do you think? No, Maharaj, I do not know because uh, I've heard also that uh, we should not uh, donate also to like organs and all because uh, God has given us the body and it should go back like uh, it's a temporary reason. That was my understanding. I do not know, Maharaj. Uh -huh. I am just wanting. Well, definitely we should be careful who we give. If you're going to give organs, you want to be careful who you give them to. You don't want to give organs to somebody who's not a devotee. Yes, Maharaj. But if you give organs to a devotee, then that's charity. That's the highest, yes. that's the highest charity. Yes, Maharaj. But so if you... So generally when blood and all we give, we do not know to whom we are giving exactly, because they just take the blood and... Yes, they give right. Back and they give so. Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, and you give blood to people who, and then they, they go off and do more sin. Yes. Maharaj, is there any reaction of that, Maharaj? Like if we also take the blood from somebody else, which is in the back during like surgery or something is there, and we get to receive the blood from other person from the bank or somewhere, so that will affect our moods or anything, Maharaj, like that? Well, well, some karma must, must, there must be some karma there. There must be some karma involved if you're taking some blood from someone. I don't know about uh, the, how much the modes will be affected, you know. The, I don't know about that, but definitely there will be some, some effects there. We want to be cautious. We know in the Srimad Bhagavatam they have the example of Dadichi. Indra came to ask Dadichi for the bones from his body. <laughs> right? Yes, that is Dadichi Maharaj. Dadichi they asked the bones for making the yeah. instruments to fight against the Asuras. Mm. <laughs> and so Dadichi he gave it, you know, he gave that charity. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, we'll just see, let's see, where's, oh, oh, this is going on to chapter 18, this is the summary of chapter 18. We won't look at that yet, we're not here, but here's a quote from, from the 16th chapter about the importance of coming to the mode of goodness. Can someone read? Let's see her, Rise oneself to standard of goodness. One has to rise himself at least to the mood of goodness before the path to understanding the Supreme Lord can be opened. Without rising oneself to the standard of the mood of goodness, one remains in, in ignorance and patience, which are the cause of demonia by the Supreme Twenty-Four. Thank you. So, coming to the mode of goodness again. This one is from 17th chapter. Someone else read? Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, without coming to the platform of Sattva Guna, nobody can advance in spiritual life. That is a fact. Just like nobody is allowed to enter the law college unless he is a graduate. This restriction is there. What he will understand? Law. He must be a graduate. So similarly, first of all, one has to come to the platform of Sattva Guna. Then spiritual knowledge begins. Bhagavad Gita 17, uh, 1 to 3, Honolulu, July 4th, 1974. Thank you, Prabhu. So Prabhupada, Prabhupada gives this very interesting example about the law college. You want to study law, first be a graduate, then they'll take you. If you're not a graduate, difficult. Read. You want to continue? Yes, right. 
So, if people will become Krishna conscious, then certainly they will develop the mode of goodness. We have to just get them interested <laughs> to take up Krishna consciousness. I was hearing how uh, uh, Prabhupada came to G Geneva. He spent actually 10 days in Geneva in Switzerland and he met with the governor of Geneva there and the governor in Geneva was worried that so many young people were going, joining the Hare Krishna movement. He thought, how will, they, how will our economy ever develop if everyone joins Hare Krishna? But he didn't understand that if, if everyone joins Krishna consciousness, then they'll all, become in the, they'll all come to the mode of goodness. And that will solve a lot of problems. If people are in the mode of goodness, you don't have all the problems with criminals, and you don't have all the drunkards, you don't have all the drug addicts, so many things you don't have. So it's such a big improvement. Yes, someone can read this new quote? Yes? Can I read, Maharaj? Yes. Through Krishna consciousness, society will develop the mode of goodness. Even one is not in goodness, even one is in the darkest part of the quality of ignorance, still he can be immediately elevated to the spiritual platform. So this Krishna consciousness movement is directly offering the spiritual platform, which is above the mode of goodness. The quality of goodness will automatically be there. Bhagavad Gita 2.40-245, Los Angeles, system. So this is a very interesting statement that <laughs> Prabhupada said even you're in the darkest ignorance you can be raised to the spiritual platform. Of course it's a big jump up if you're, away, if you're really in the mode of ignorance and then to come to the spiritual platform it takes a big transformation, a big change. Sometimes it's possible but not often. Sometimes we'd have people come up from the mode of ignorance and for some time they would come to the transcendental platform, but you know, they have to really get established in the mode of goodness and then they can make the proper adjustment. So quality of goodness has to be there. And here's a nice verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, often quoted to help us understand about the importance of the mode of goodness. Yeah. And translation. Stitam Sadvi, as soon as irrevocable loving service is established in the heart, the effects of nature's modes of passion and ignorance, such as lust, desire and hankering, disappear from the heart. Then the devotee is established in goodness and he becomes completely happy. Oh. Okay, so the one section we didn't complete yet in the Bhagavad Gita, we've still got that section on Om Tat Sat, so let's go back to that, to Bhagavad Gita, and we're on text number 23, yeah? Text number 23, from the beginning of creation, the above words, Om Tat Sat, were used to indicate the Supreme Absolute Truth. These three symbolic representations were used by Brahmanas while chanting the hymns of the Vedas and during sacrifices for the satisfaction of the Supreme. Actually, if you see some of Prabhupada's early letters, 
he would often write at the end, he would put Om Tat Sat. Just at the end of every letter, he'd write Om Tat Sat. So, Om is the Supreme Lord. Tat means that and Sat, eternal. Om Tat Sat means it's a rep representation of the Supreme Lord. So Prabhupada explains that, uh, let's read the purport. It has been explained, penance, sacrifice, charity, foods are divided into three categories, goodness, passion and ignorance. But whether first class, second class or third class, they are all conditioned, contaminated by the material modes of nature. When they are aimed at the Supreme, Om Tat Sat, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Eternal, they become means for spiritual elevation. Is everybody with me? Text number, text, text 23, yeah, purport. In the scriptural injunction, such an objective is indicated. These three words, Om Tat Sat, indicate the absolute truth, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In the Vedic hymns, the word Om is always found. One who acts without following regulation of scripture will not attain the absolute truth. He will get some temporary result, but not the ultimate end of life. The conclusion is that the performance of charity, sacrifice and penance must be done in the mode of goodness. Performed in the mode of passion or ignorance, they are certainly inferior in quality. The three words, Om Tat Sat, are uttered in conjunction with the holy name of the Supreme Lord. Om Tat Vishnu. Whenever a Vedic hymn or the holy name of the Lord is uttered, Om is added. This is the indication of Vedic literature. The three words are taken from Vedic hymns. Om Iti Tad Brahmano Nidishtam Nama, which indicates the first goal. Then Tatvamasi indicates the second goal. And Sad Eva Saumya indicates the third goal. Combined they become Om Tat Sat. Formerly, when Brahma, the first created living entity, performed sacrifice, he indicated by these three words the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, the same principle has always been followed by disciplic succession. So this hymn has great significance. Bhagavad Gita recommends, therefore, any work done should be done for Om Tat Sat, or for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When one performs penance, charity and sacrifice with these three words, he is acting in Krishna Consciousness. Krishna Consciousness is a scientific ex execution of transcendental activities which enables one to return home back to Godhead. There is no loss of energy in acting in such a transcendental way. All right, so that's pretty much all we need to know about Om Tat Sat. It's a representation of the Supreme Lord. So we'll just go over the objectives. We had a look at chapter 17, the three divisions. We talked about the merits of different religious practices and how they also represent different uh, modes of faith. And then we spoke about charity, what is proper and improper charity. And we've heard about the importance of the mode of goodness in the practice of Krishna Consciousness. And we have heard also how Krishna Consciousness can be cultivated even if we're not in the mode of goodness. We don't have to be in the mode of goodness to become Krishna. We can, from any position, one can come to Krishna Consciousness. 
final quotation from Prabhupada, because people have no education in actual knowledge, they become irresponsible. To stop this irresponsibility, education for developing the mode of goodness of the people in general must be there. When they are actually educated in the mode of goodness, they will become sober, in full knowledge of things as they are. Then people will be happy and prosperous. Even if the majority of the people aren't happy and prosperous, except if, if a certain percentage of the population develops Krishna consciousness and becomes situated in the mode of goodness, then there is the possibility for peace and prosperity all over the world. From the 14th chapter, purport of text 17. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Any questions? Well, we saw two. Uh, we saw the slide in which it was said uh, a graduate can only understand the uh, law. He cannot understand it without being graduated. And simultaneously, we discussed uh, the importance of coming to the mode of goodness for uh, becoming a, a pure devotee or uh, Krishna consciousness. And then and now we are seeing that uh, from any position, one can come to Krishna consciousness, which is uh, rightly said. So. Uh, if you could just explain it uh, <laughs> yeah from any position one can come to krishna consciousness appears to be so c contradictions huh? yes well the, the the point is there that from any position one can take up krishna consciousness but if you want to actually become situated in Krishna consciousness, you have to really come to the mode of goodness. From any position, whatever position you're in, you can take up spiritual activity. You can begin to practice devotional service. But if you're going to actually remain situated in devotional service, you have to come to the mode of goodness. That's how it is. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. And Maharaj, in verse 23rd, in the purport, it is mentioned that whether first class, second class, or third class, they are all contaminated, contaminated by the moods of material nature. When they are aimed at a supreme, Om Tat Sat, the supreme personality of Godhead, the eternal, they become means for spiritual elevation. Uh, does that uh, mean that uh, even if one, uh, these, I mean, austerity, penance, or speech, even if they are third class, if they are even at Supreme Lord, they will become means of elevation? If they are, uh, we discuss about the austerity of speech, austerity of uh, uh, we, uh, different austerities, different kind of charities, different kind of penances we discussed. And it, it does it from this statement, it, this proper means that even if they are in the mode of ignorance or even if they are in the mode of passion, if they are aimed at the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then it can result in spiritual elevation. Yes, that's, a, that's an interesting point, Prabhu. Uh, that it was mentioned there about first class, second class. and So does it mean that people who are doing the third class activities, can they offer them, can they be done as an offering? Prabhupada seems to indicate that when they are aimed at the Supreme, the Eternal, they become means for spiritual elevation, right? So that's the point, you're going to get spiritual elevation. It's not actually, it's not like it's pure devotional service. But certainly you get some spiritual elevation, you get some benefit if it's aimed at the Supreme, even though it's contaminated with the modes of nature, even though it's, you know, not first class, it's second class or third class, it's in the mode of passion or it's in the mode of ignorance, the charity, 
But if it's done for the, for the Supreme, the intention of pleasing the Supreme, then there's some benefit there. Okay. So uh, if I just bring in a case study inside it, like uh, if you uh, go and ask for donations to the people, and uh, if, uh, if you have an influential person, like if he's a very uh, senior and respected person, sometimes he's uh, a devotee, sorry, uh, influential devotee, and he pushes his relatives for some donation, and they do it even unwillingly, uh, uh, maybe out, as we discussed, uh, out of, uh, what was the exact word? Uh, out of being pushed by that senior, <coughs> senior, uh, uh, that senior devotee who is having good representing, uh, uh, is having good, uh, uh, what would say, standing in the society, he's respected. It's just they do it unwillingly, and out of that push they do it, they're gonna get some benefit, obviously. It's not, it, that a charity won't go as a charity mode of ignorance. But they will simultaneously get a benefit of it because they're doing it for the Supreme Lord. Yes. But they okay. do book distribution. We sometimes try to push people, and sometimes they just take it because we are we are irritating to them. <laughs> if they happen to take it, then it's going to be beneficial to them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they do it grudgingly. They didn't want to take the book, so grudgingly they purchased the book because you really pushed them to get it, so they get the book. So it's in the mode of passion. The passion is there. But they got the book, and the book, is, the book has got transcendental knowledge. So if they take the book and read it, then they get more, the, the real benefit. If they don't read the book, they don't get much benefit. What benefit do they get? Grudgingly they gave a donation. Grudgingly they bought the book. So that's the mode of passion. But if they read the book, then they benefit. They really benefit. Just giving the donation and taking the book, that's, that was the mode of passion. But if they read the book, then they get some, they can really get spiritual benefit. They can progress. They may not read the book immediately, it may take some time. Or they may take the book home and they give it to someone else. And so then they get some benefit. They give the book to somebody else. Now, uh, till the point they read, uh, they come to the reading of the book, even if they take it, are they going to get some benefit if they take it out of grudging mood? If they don't read it, they just take it because of some grudging mood, or they give some donation because of some grudging mood, are they going to get some spiritual relation with that? Just by taking the book? If it is by a grudging mood, if it is in the mood of passion or ignorance. Yeah, they take the book, but they don't use it, they don't read it, they just keep it at home. Are they going to benefit? They'll benefit a little, but not much. You know, you're not going to get a lot of benefit. Some benefit will be there because it's a spiritual book. It's, it's Prabhupada, it's got Krishna's picture there and Krishna's devotees. And so there's some benefit there. Just by taking the book, they keep the book there. They didn't read it, they didn't even look at it, but they keep the book, it's on their bookshelf. Some benefit, little benefit, not much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, any other questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, regarding the books only, I would like to more clarification. You told that. Uh, uh, some people, if they, they just take the book and keep it in the bookshelf, there's little uh, benefit. But in India especially, many have this understanding that, okay, Bhagavad Gita means it's a holy book. So they, instead of reading, they just put in their altar, puja altar. And uh, so what is the thing? I mean, they might not read it and they might just um, unknowingly worship it, not... Uh, with an intention. 
There's no harm in that. Prabhupada said we could worship his books. We were traveling, doing Sankirtan, and we thought maybe we should have deities. Prabhupada said, no, you don't need deities. He said, you have my books. He said, you can worship my books. And so people are taking the book, the Bhagavad Gita, and they put the Bhagavad Gita on their altar and they worship it. Very good. Of course, it will be better if they read it. It will be better if they read something from the book. But they're doing something, they put it on the altar and they worship it. Very good. They get benefit for that. If they have the book, they take it home, put it on their bookcase, they also get some benefit. They get more benefit, they put it on the altar and worship it. But they get more benefit, the most benefit, when they start reading it. Any other questions? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I would like to just know about the austerities. Maharaj, I have heard that like uh, women need not uh, do so much of austerities even in, in Krishna consciousness. Can you just give some guidance on that Maharaj or some this one? Is it so and what type of austerities women can, should undergo or can undergo? Well, how much? remember what was described, how the austerity was described. Austerity in goodness was speaking words which are pleasing and truthful, right? And worshipping superiors. So women are supposed to do these things. Women are supposed to come and worship their mother and father, or their mother-in-law, their father-in-law, respect them. Do you touch the feet of your father-in-law? Yes, you see, you wash it, you do it, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's, that's austerity in the mode of goodness. And recite, recite. Huh? Yes, they need not do any other austerities, Maharaj, like they Like what? Take well, like, we, uh, yes, Maharaj? What, what, what kind of austerity do you mean? Like what? No, women don't have to, they don't have to fast, they don't have to, they don't have to torture their bodies, <laughs> they don't have to do these things, no, that's all austerity in the mode of ignorance. No, but women are expected to do the same austerity as a man, just like all of us, you speak the truth and be, speak pleasing and be satisfied, control the mind, right? And cleanliness and simplicity, recite the Vedas, recite scriptures. Women do all, all of these things. That, that is the austerity we're supposed to do. But, and, and you know, the austerities like what some Shivites do, or maybe cut flesh off their body, <laughs> no, you don't have to do that. You don't have to cut flesh off your body. Yes. You don't have to torture yourself. You don't have to stick hooks in your body or put a spear through your cheeks. That's all in the mode of ignorance. Even uh, you can see how, you know, in, in Sri Vaishnavism they have tilak and they, they, they burn the tilak into the skin. Mm. But in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, we simply use chandan, and we take the chandan and smear the chandan on the body as tilak. So that burning into the skin, that's not, that's not really the mode of goodness, because it's quite painful to burn, use the hot brass thing and burn into the skin, make a mark on the skin. We don't have to do that. Lord Chaitanya's movement is very merciful. Yes. To simply take prasadam and chant and dance and 
put Kuntimala, wear Kuntimala around your neck and decorate the body with tilak. That's the mode of goodness. And Prabhupada spoke about waking up early in the morning, mm. worshipping the deity, taking bath two, three times a day. That's austerity and goodness. Any other question? No, but there are no questions. All right. So we'll finish here tomorrow. We'll go on to chapter 18. Okay. We have three days to finish the last chapter. So thank you all very much. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur, Gaur Bhakti Vrinda ki. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.